we looked at the story of uh, uh, Christmas, the Annunciation of, the, of Mary, the Gabriel coming to Mary. So tonight we want to look at then the Easter story as we continue our way through the Gospel. God's trilogy will be our first topic. Adam and Eve lost paradise. They lost the ability to see God. They lost the ability to hear God. They lost the ability to live in the kingdom of God. They chose death, and the life of God that fills paradise began to fade from their view, began to drain away until Adam and Eve were only left with living in death. Life withdrew from them, and they found themselves on the outside of life. Well, I've diagrammed it. The only way I know how to, to, to do that is here is the world of life. Here is paradise, the visible and the invisible together. Only the invisible wasn't invisible yet. But Adam and Eve chose to step out of life into the world of death. And in that world then, they began to lose their hearing, they began to lose their seeing, and the things that are now invisible, the things of God became invisible to them. They no longer heard the things of God. They're living in this world of death. I've also diagrammed it differently to say this is the life we had, and then they stepped into death, not so much a hole as in a different place, but if, if this is the invisible that was present, it would not have been present here. It became invisible to them. I, I, there's no way to describe it, but to try to picture it that suddenly they, it just began to fade from them. And they were left with only the world of the five senses that they had chosen uh, to live in. Uh, we use the language, they were expelled from paradise. They were banished. They were excluded. Uh, they became refugees wandering in this strange world of death. You see, we tend to think geographically that they were expelled from a particular location. But geography is only a metaphor. Uh, they were expelled existentially and ontologically. The, what they once saw, they no longer could see. What they could once hear, they could no longer hear. The kingdom of God disappeared. Uh, though it was still present, for all intents and purposes, it was no longer there. They couldn't experience it. And so they were banished from the realm of life to the realm of death, and life drained out of them, and they became, as it were, walking dead men and women, de a dead man and a dead woman. But in the fullness of time, God's plan of restoration reached fulfillment. God's purpose for mankind had never changed. Mankind's purpose Mankind's goal was to become like God, to join in our behavior so that our behavior was like our nature. Our nature is the image of God, and our behavior was to begin to behave like God, to behave like who we are created to be. But what Adam failed to achieve, what each one of us has failed to achieve, God achieved on our behalf. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. As St. Athanasius stated and the Orthodox Church has affirmed, God became man so that we could become God, so we could become godlike in our behavior. The purpose of creation is union with God. Union with God is called theosis or deification. In the fullness of time, God undertook the restoration of mankind to paradise. This restoration to paradise involves three distinct steps that we're going to look at 
this evening involve the incarnation crucifixion and resurrection. God's plan is going to be restored. Adam did not fulfill his vocation. Adam and Eve did not achieve the purpose for which they were created. They did not achieve this theosis, this union with God, this joining and matching of their behavior with the image of God they carried in them. But the plan of God was not destroyed by the sin of man. The vocation of the first Adam was fulfilled by Christ the second Adam. God became man in order that man might become God. To use the words of Irenaeus and Athanasius and echoed by the fathers and theologians of every age. According to St. Gregory of Nyssa in the 300s, 4th century, the infinite distance between the created and the uncreated the natural separation of mankind from God, which ought to have become overcome by deification, became an impassable abyss for man after he had willed himself into a state, near state of non-being. In order to reach that union with God to which creation is called, it was then necessary to break through the triple barrier of sin, death, and nature. This path of theosis, deification, agreement between how we're living and the image of God within us that was planned for Adam and Eve became impossible after they chose death instead of life. The divine plan was not fulfilled by Adam. Instead of a straight line of ascent towards God, the will of the first man followed a path contrary to nature, contrary to the image, contrary to who we are, and ending in death. What man ought to have attained by raising himself up to God God achieved by descending to man. That is why the triple barrier which separates us from God, death, sin, and nature, impassable for man, is broken through by God in the reverse order. Death, sin, nature will be broken through in reverse order, coming from this side then. Nicholas Cavasius, a Byzantine theologian of the 14th century, expressed it this way. The Lord allowed men separated from God by the triple barrier of nature, sin, and death, to be fully possessed of him and to be directly united to him by the fact that he set aside each barrier in turn, that of nature by his incarnation, sin by his death, and death by his resurrection. Our distance from God, finite nature, divine nature, is enjoined in the incarnation. We're going to discuss the human sin, the human will, and it's how it is cured by the crucifixion, and then how death is overcome by the resurrection. First of all, then, the incarnation. The division, the separation of God's nature and our nature is overcome in the incarnation of Christ. 
who is fully God and fully man. For St. Maximus in the 6th century, the incarnation, sarcosis, and deification, theosis, correspond to one another. They mutually imply each other. If God takes on flesh, you have then the joining of the two natures together. God descends to the world and becomes man, and man is raised towards divine fullness and becomes God. Because this union of two natures, the divine and the human, has been determined in the eternal counsel of God, and because it is the final end for which the world has been created out of nothing. Uh, God became flesh and dwelt among us. God became the second Adam to remind us and to show us who we are to become. Christ was fully God and fully man. The incarnation unites the two natures, the divine and the human, together. The incarnation also sets before us our goal and our purpose to become like God. We are meant to unite the human and the divine within ourselves. That is why we looked at creation, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. We have been created in the image that is a, a, our ontological DNA, if you will, that which defines who humanity is. And then we are to achieve the likeness. We, by being given free will, have been given the opportunity to choose to be who we are. Now, a robin can't choose to be a robin. A robin is going to behave as a robin. A robin never behaves as a blue jay, and vice versa. They do not have free will, and so they behave in agreement with their nature. They uh, behave in agreement with how they were created to be. So who they are and how they behave are the same. That is not true for us. Who we are, the image of God, and how we behave are two separate things. And by our human will, we were to have chosen to behave like our nature, to be who we were created to be, which would then be joining humanity with divinity together within us. You see, this concept of theosis is therefore not generic. It's extremely personal. It's personal with each one of us. This is our purpose because we each carry within us the image of God, and it is our behavior that is either in agreement with who we are, or is in disagreement with who we are. In the West, spirituality is often defined at the expense of the human. We touched on this in one of our earlier sessions. The more spiritual one becomes, we think, in the West, and the less human uh, they seek to be. But you see, God was fully, Christ was fully God and fully man. Theosis, becoming like God, is not a negation of being human. We live in a world of death. Our humanity is less than the full humanity that Adam and Eve had at creation. We lost our eyesight and we've lost our hearing. We have lost the life of God coursing through our lives. We are less than who we used to be. And I've said this before, my family absolutely does not care how, quote, spiritual I am. They don't care how many hours a day I pray or whether I pray or not. Whether I pray kneeling on sharp rocks and, and, and beat myself over the back with chains. They don't care. They, however, do care whether or not I am becoming a better husband and a better father. Am I more attentive? Am I more compassionate towards them? And I, am I kinder? Am I more gentle towards them? Am I willing to give up of myself in their behalf? 
if my being around God makes me a better person, then my family will thank God for it and perhaps even be drawn themselves to spend time with God. You see, the incarnation points us to our beginning in paradise and points us to our humanity that we have lost. We are less than who we were created to be when first created. Theosis, becoming like God, involves growing in our humanity as well as in becoming like God. Christ was fully God and, and fully man but we are not yet fully human. The incarnation opens the door for us to become once again who we were when first created fully human. So the incarnation is step one. This is a huge event. It is not just uh, a necessary thing so they can have a crucifixion. It's easy to reduce the incarnation to nothing more than we needed a human being so someone could die. Uh, if, if we're going to have a substitutionary atonement like the West has, then we have to have a victim. We have to have a, 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 a sacrifice that will be able to die in our behalf. And so, unfortunately, so much in the, in the West, the, the incarnation eventually in the common mind just gets reduced to creating the, 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 the human body that had to die. Uh, in, in our, but that's not true at all. It, the incarnation reminds us of paradise and reminds us that we were created to behave and to become like God in ourselves and to join the human and the divine together within ourselves. Well, secondly, then, the crucifixion. The crucifixion removes the barrier of sin that, are, that weakens our will and causes us to fail in our becoming like God. St. Gregory of Nyssa said that sin is an invention of the created will. It isn't the devil that makes us sin. It is our own weak will. Since Adam and Eve's failure to say no to death and yes to life, we now lack the willpower to say yes to life and no to death. The term harmatia, sin, simply means to miss the mark, to aim at a target and to miss the bullseye. It means to fail at one's purpose, to miss the point, Harmartia, in its largest sense, means to miss the point of one's life. Let me give just a personal illustration, if I may. At my chrismation into the Orthodox faith, I entered the church as Ezra. I was drawn to this Old Testament prophet because Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. Even though I was not a teacher, there was a cry within me to do the same as Ezra in the Old Testament. So when I was ordained a subdeacon in February of 2000, my private chrismation name became a public name at the ordination. Uh, I was known as subdeacon Ezra, and then when I was ordained a deacon, then as deacon Ezra. Since then, since that moment that my name became public as Ezra, I have taught nearly nonstop every week at St. Elijah since 2000. I have taught at retreats and seminars, in addition, I was asked to teach at the University of the Central of Central Oklahoma. I mentioned this because I never knew I was a teacher. I did not know this is who I am. 
I was over 50 years old and did not know who I was vocationally. In a very real sense, I had missed my whole life. I had lived my whole life missing the point of my life. And I thank God and I'm very grateful to God that he showed me who I was while there was some time left in my life to get to be it. I've said that as an illustration. It's much larger than just a vocation. We live in the world of sin, a world that misses the point of life. I was blind to my own identity, not just vocationally, but to my identity for which I had been created. In a far greater sense, mankind is blind to its identity. We are missing the point of our own lives, the point of our own creation. We don't need to buy a book that tells us to have a purpose in life. We are created for a purpose, and that purpose is to walk with God in the cool of the evening that we might become like him. We exist because God has called us by name. Our purpose is to become who God meant us to be when he called each of us by our particular name. Each of us is a unique and unrepeatable person called by God to be that person where the likeness of our behavior is in agreement with the image of God placed in us at the moment of our conception that is who we are to begin to be. You see, sin is the product of a weakened will. St. Paul said, the good that I want to do, I fail to do, while the evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing anyway. Sin is an issue of our weakened will. I have good intentions to go home after work and in the summertime mow the yard, maybe in the fall to uh, rake the leaves, uh, clean the spare room, read a book, exercise. But when I get home, I spend the evening watching television instead. Or if it's a basketball season, maybe the thunder if they're on television. Uh, the issue is not that I did something morally bad. It's that my will is so weak that I cannot even do the very things that I said I wanted to do and intended to do. We've got to get beyond just sin being a moral issue. It is an issue of the will. We are all sinners. We've all got a puny will. We each have a weak and defective will. Death is the only cure for a weak will, which means it's the only cure for sin. In my Protestant days, I was the pastor of a small country church. A young couple had two children, both diagnosed with neuroblastoma, a cancer that strikes infants and children. The odds were astronomical that two children inside the same family would have this disease. Tracy was seven years old when she died. The family had gathered in her hospital room where she died in her uncle's arms. Her father, racing to get there, arrived moments after she had passed. I was in the room. It was the first time I had ever seen a person die. Having killed Tracy, the cancer now furiously attacked her younger brother, Tony. With one child buried, the parents doubled their efforts in trying to save their remaining child. But the cancer grew. The next six months were filled with emergency runs to the hospital for blood transfusions. Regularly scheduled cancer treatments were suffered and endured, but the cancer grew, disfiguring the little boy's face. 
The physician treating Tony called me in. She explained everything had failed. The blood transfusions were no longer helping fight the cancer. In fact, the transfusions were now feeding the cancer and causing it to grow. She asked my assistance in standing with this young couple as they made the toughest decision any parent could ever make to stop the blood transfusions. These brave parents took Tony home. They didn't want him to die in a hospital like his sister. They called me that night. I went to their home. There were five of us there, the parents, myself, and the uncle, holding Tony as he had Tracy. Two hours later, I called the hospital and told them Tony had died. I helped the father as he carried his son in his arms to the car as we took Tony's body to the hospital. The only way to kill the cancer was for Tony to die. The only way to kill the sin in our lives, to kill our weakened wills, is to die. Christ died on the cross to show us the death of sin, even though he was sinless. But how long does death last? And that brings us from the crucifixion to the resurrection. On Sunday morning, the first day of the week, the myrrh-bearing women went to Christ's tomb to finish the funeral. They carried spices with them to perfume the body. At the tomb, they were confronted with the reality of the resurrection. The resurrection does not fit any human category. It is outside any matrix of thought. Beyond description, beyond comprehension, and beyond explanation, the reality of the resurrection met them. God had given Moses a pattern of the, uh, of the earthly tabernacle on Mount Sinai, and he told Moses to construct a box, an ark, to hold the Ten Commandments and its lid, known as the mercy seat, and facing each other on the mercy seat were the, the two cherubim, uh, the, the two angels with their wings outstretched across the mercy seat uh, towards each other. Uh, maybe you saw the, uh, it's a very old movie by now, the uh, Indiana Jones Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, in which they have the lost ark in the movie, and it had the mercy seat lid that gets blown off it. Uh, at, at near the end of the movie, but on that you would have seen the depiction of the two angelic beings uh, out with their outstretched wings across each other with a space in between them where they don't, they don't touch. God had told Moses, and there I will meet you from above the mercy seat, from above between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony. I'm going to meet you between the wings of the cherubim at the mercy seat. You see, God does not meet us inside the box, inside the ark with its laws. God meets us outside the box, between the wings of the cherubim at the place of mercy. Fast forward to that Sunday morning. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she beheld two angels in white sitting one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. She saw the flat stone slab with an angel at each end. God said he would meet us between the angels at the place of mercy. It is in the resurrection that God meets us. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that completes the restoration and makes possible our return to paradise. 
Jesus told Dismas, the penitent thief, today you will be with me in paradise. The Paschal Troparion, that's our Easter hymn, declares Christ has risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, bestowing life. In the refrains of the second antiphon that we sing in the divine liturgy, O Son of God, who art risen from the dead, save us who sing unto thee, hallelujah. O Son of God, who art risen from the dead, save us who sing unto thee, hallelujah. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. O Son of God, who art risen from the dead, Save us who sing unto thee, hallelujah, both now and ever, unto ages of ages, amen. O only begotten Son and Word of God, who art immortal, yet didst condescend for our salvation to be incarnate of the holy Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary, and without change was made man and was crucified also, O Christ our God, and by thy death didst death subdue, who art one of the Holy Trinity, glorified together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, save us. You see, the reality of the resurrection is real. Death kills our sin and our weakened wills. But Christ's resurrection defeated death. So how long does death last? St. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He proclaimed that death had swallowed us, that the death that had swallowed us had itself now been swallowed in victory. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what the prophet Hosea had foretold has come to pass. I will deliver them out of the hand of Hades. I will redeem them from death. Where is your penalty, O death? O Hades, where is your sting? In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Well, let us notice the response of Thomas. At first, the disciples did not know what to think. They ran to the tomb and found it empty, like the women had said. Some believed, others did not know what to believe. Then Christ, the risen Savior, appeared to them, and they believed. All believed but Thomas, who was not there in the upper room that Sunday. But he was there a week later when once more Christ appeared. In the face of revelation... Thomas needed no empirical proof or rational explanation. He fell on his knees in worship, my Lord and my God. You see, Thomas is not the great doubter. He is the great worshiper. He is the great believer. If Christ has not been raised, then our faith is worthless. If Christ has not been raised, then everything we believe and proclaim is false and worthless. If we only follow the teachings of Christ as a moral guide that we find beneficial to us in this life, one among many possible moral guides chosen out of personal preference, then St. Paul said, we are of all men most to be pitied. St. Thomas did not follow Jesus because he needed a moral code to follow. He fell on his knees and worshipped the risen Savior, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, our response. We gather every week on Sunday, the first day of the week, to celebrate the resurrection. At Pascha, our Easter, and for 40 days thereafter, we sing the hymn of Easter, the Troparion of Pascha. And in addition to that hymn, the Orthodox Church has eight other hymns, Troparia, for the resurrection. We sing a different one each Sunday for eight weeks, and then we cycle through them again. 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our victory over death. We proclaim it every Sunday. Like Thomas, we proclaim, my Lord and my God, by declaring the resurrection every Sunday. That first week in the cycle, tone one, the stone being sealed by the Jews and thy pure body being guarded by the soldiers, thou didst ra rise on the third day, O Savior, granting life to the world, wherefore the heavenly powers acclaim thee, O giver of life, crying glory to thy resurrection, O Christ, glory to thy kingdom, glory to thy gracious providence, O thou only lover of mankind. The next week we're going to sing, and we sing these, and I don't have a good voice for singing, so I will spare you. I need Rachel to come and be our singer here, Rachel. When thou, O immortal life, didst humble thyself unto death, then didst thou destroy death by the brightness of thy Godhead. And when thou didst raise the bowels of the earth, then all the heavenly powers exclaimed, O Christ, thou art the giver of life, Glory to thee, O our God. The third week, let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad, for the Lord hath done a mighty act with his own arm. He has trampled down death and become the firstborn from the dead. He hath delivered us from the depth of Hades, granting to the world the great mercy. The fourth week, having learned the joyful message of the resurrection from the angel, the women disciples cast from them their parental condemnation and proudly broke the news to the disciples, saying, Death has been spoiled. Christ God is risen, granting the world great mercy. And the fifth week, let us believers praise and worship the word, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, born of the Virgin for our salvation, for he took pleasure in ascending the cross in the flesh to suffer death and to raise the dead by his glorious resurrection. Then on the sixth week, Mary, when Mary stood at thy grave, looking for thy sacred body, angelic powers shone above thy revered tomb, and the soldiers who were keeping guard became as dead men. Thou led Hades captive and was not tempted thereby. Thou didst meet the virgin and didst give life to the world. O thou that art risen from the dead, O Lord, glory to thee. Then on the seventh week, thou didst shatter death by thy cross. Thou didst open paradise to the thief. Thou didst turn the sadness of the ointment-bearing women into joy and it's bid thine apostles proclaim a warning that thou hast risen, O Christ, granting the world great mercy. And then, to finish the cycle, the eighth week, O compassionate one, thou didst descend from the heights, thou didst submit to the three-day burial, that thou mightest deliver us from passion. Thou art our life and our resurrection, O oh Lord, glory to Thee. You see, we stand in the presence of the resurrection. We cannot explain the resurrection. We do not try. We stand in awe and we worship. In our worship, we will say what God has done. Holy Trinity, you have done this and this. But we do not stop with simply or only with a recital of what God has done. We then respond to what God has done. Therefore, glory to thee. We worship, standing in awe before the mystery of God in our lives. We worship. Now, we have talked about this as a whole. The incarnation, God choosing to come to us, choosing to divest himself of uh, the privileges of divinity. He was still divine, he was still God, but he did not choose to come on earth and act 
with his majesty. He came taking the form of that uh, simple servant to be one of us. But when we look at him, we look at God being a man showing us who God is. We see the compassion of God. We see the, the self-emptying in our behalf nature of God. We see him taking on our humanity to do what we had failed to do, which is to join the likeness of our behavior to the divine image that we carry within us. He did it. And when we look at him, we see, ah, that's who we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to look like. This is how we're supposed to begin behaving. Not that I go and just, I just by rote copy his behavior. You see, his behavior was in complete with agreement with who he is. He's the only human being that ever lived in complete agreement with who he is. Think of it. We talked about the Robins. We talked about the, the, the Blue Jays being in agreement with who they All of creation is in agreement with itself except humanity. All of it. And the only human being that has ever lived on this planet that was in agreement with who he is was Jesus Christ. As a human being, in his humanity, in agreement with the image of God that that humanity carried within it. And as the fully Son of God, second person of the Trinity, in behaving like God, God is the canonic one, the self-emptying one, the ecstatic one, the one who steps out of himself and creates all this out of nothing. And God then, in becoming one of us, demonstrates who God is, he behaved in complete agreement with his divinity, and he was behaving in complete agreement with his humanity, the image of God in his humanity as well. This is staggering, what all is being accomplished in the incarnation, and then the self-emptying that takes place in the crucifixion. He said, uh, you know, greater love had no man than he's willing to die for his friend. He was willing to die for his enemies. If there's no greater love than us dying for a friend, how do we even describe dying for those that killed him? He loved them as much as he loves us. We feel pretty good about him loving us. We like knowing he loves us, but he loved those that killed him as much as he loves us. He died for them and in their behalf equally as he did dying in our behalf and giving himself for our salvation. He could have called down those legions of angels. He could have said, looky here, just who do you think you are? See, that's our human response, wanting to defend ourselves when we are being rejected when we are being abused, or when someone doesn't recognize our proper station in life. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know who you're talking? We know what I'm talking about here. We all have that rare up in us. How dare you treat me this way? Look at Christ. As a human being, in his humanity, not calling down the angels. In his divinity, not calling down the angels. He didn't strike out. He had the will. He didn't surrender his will in the garden. He exercised his will and chose to do the will of the Father. He willed to be like the image of God in him, and God is the one who empties himself in behalf of others. God is the one who wins by losing. Staggering, staggering to me to comprehend, and I don't fully comprehend what all is happening. And then, it's ineffable. All of it. it, it just, we just touch on it. The resurrection. The three-day resurrection. The, the coming to life. The restoration of life. The giving of life to us. That we, when we die, don't die. We just simply have stepped over a, a, a line. Eo instante. Instantaneously passed from this form of life to that form of life. And in our baptism, sacramentally, we've already 
died with Christ. In the life we're now living, we live by faith in, in Christ uh, who, who died for us. And, and it's no longer our life, it's his life we're beginning to live in us. And if I'm already sacramentally died, and I'm already beginning to live in the kingdom, and I'm already beginning to hear already, now already, live this life, I'm just walking with God in the cool of the evening, and I did, you're right, I stepped across the line. It's gone. I'm over here now. Oh, death, where is your victory? We've already faced that in our baptism. We've already accepted beginning to live in agreement with our deontological DNA that begins to take place inside of us. Well, I, this is staggering. I don't have the words for this. All I've got is these little tiny words and little tiny thoughts standing against something so huge that I don't know. It's impossible to, to, to talk about. And yet, we try to share the best we can with it. I think that's probably a really good halftime stopping point. So why don't we stop there? We'll make our way into the uh, fellowship hall for our break. We'll come back afterwards and finish up this evening then. Thank you. Well, welcome back after our break together. Let me make just a comment before we get started. We were talking about becoming like God, and just like the, the term Theotokos, mother of God, sounds so foreign to our Western ears, uh, becoming like God, becoming God-like in our behavior, uh, is also an extremely foreign-sounding term. And I, I don't want it to get confused with uh, some erroneous groups that run around preaching a version of a, a gospel that we become God. The, the Orthodox Church is, we, we, we do not become God by nature. We do not become divinity. We are always human. We are always in our humanity, but we are achieving the likeness of God in our behavior. We are becoming like God. Uh, as we see that, that Christ emptied himself and took the form of a servant, that is behaving like God. And he's also then, once on earth, as a human being, he was always acting the same way in behalf of others. And, and, and so it is beginning to have that life of compassion and self-emptying begin to be a characteristic of our own behavior, uh, not just in certain moments when it's easy to be compassionate or something, but beginning to be even compassionate when we're being rejected, uh, as, as he was and so forth. So we're, we're not in any way running around saying uh, we're little gods. We're not saying that at all. In fact, it, we're, we're saying just the opposite, that we are created for our to join the likeness of our behavior, to be in agreement with the image of God, our, our DNA, if you will, that's embedded in each one of us. And that means I have to choose with my will to begin to be at one with myself, which makes me at one with God. And, and we slip out of that. It, it's, a, it's a lifelong walk of beginning to walk in that likeness so it becomes more and more a pattern of our living than just a momentary thing or a convenient uh, moment of c compassion. But, you know, when, when we get caught in the act of being ourselves, <laughs> am I looking like God and behaving or am I looking like me <laughs> is what we're talking about. So I hope that's helpful uh, on that point. So this, let me come to our next point then, the dead aren't dead. We sing Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. You see, for us, the dead aren't dead. They are alive in Christ. He bestows life upon those in the tombs. We sing thou did shatter death by thy cross, thou didst open paradise to the thief. Dismas, the penitent thief, is not dead. 
nor is St. Thomas dead. Both are invisibly present with us during our worship. They are part of the cloud of witnesses that surrounds us as they and we worship the undivided trinity simultaneously together in the liturgy. It is Thomas that leads us in declaring in worship, my Lord and my God. We point to Dismas when we quote him, when we say, but like the thief will I confess thee. Remember me, O Lord, in thy kingdom. Our departed loved ones in the Lord are not dead. They are alive in Christ. They are invisibly present during the liturgy, worshiping the undivided trinity alongside us. Jesus told us that I go to prepare a place for you, and as I go, and if I go I, and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Notice he said that where I am you may be. Christ is invisibly present with us as the high priest and liturgist of our worship. Christ tells us that where I am, you will be. Christ is invisibly here. Our loved ones are also invisibly here with him because he said, where I am, you will be. Now, I'm just not trying to use fancy logic here, but this is the, the understanding, see, of, this is the difference of what Catholicity means. Uh, in, in the West, when we use the word Catholic, uh, it, it, it means universal. We're part of the universal church. And we mean by that that we're like each, each individual parish is a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. Or each denomination is part of the jigsaw puzzle. And if you put all of them together, you finally get the church. And we're part of this giant universal church that each of us is a part of. And the church, the universal church, is then completed because by all of the parts coming together. That's not how the word Catholic is used, Catholicos, the Greek word Catholicos, uh, in, in the Eastern Church. It means fullness. It means that wherever the liturgy is being celebrated, the fullness of God is there. Uh, this is a mystery of worship. It is a mystery of the church that God is everywhere present. And when he is here, when we are worshiping him here, we are a microcosm of the church. We are a miniature of the whole but it is a miniature that is complete. It's got the fullness of the whole here. Uh, and that fullness includes, uh, we don't divide heaven up there and there's worship in heaven and there's worship on earth. There's worship. When we come to worship, we step into the divine invisible worship that's going on before we arrive and will be going on after we leave. We stepped into it, become part of it, and we jointly in our worship then with the heavenly host, with the angels, with the invisible Christ who is our liturgist, and with our departed loved ones, all of us together are jointly then worshiping God together, celebrating the joy of the resurrection. The resurrection is not just a doctrine, it is an experience that we have in worship. Our loved ones are alive not just as a doctrine, but because they are present with us. And we, the invisible, and all of us together are in this place worshiping God simultaneously. Hear the words of Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. My death will kill my wishy-washy will. It will kill my weak will and the missing of the mark that it brings. But Christ tells us that even if we die, we shall never die. He says, because I live, you shall live also. It isn't death. Death, is, death what we call death is just the end of living in death. We are already living in death. This is a life in death until we sacramentally begin to step into life and here already, now already, are beginning to live in the paradise that God created for Adam and Eve in the first place. 
Christ is, we got to get away from this linear Western viewpoint that I'm trying to do something now, so if I'm good enough, I'll get to heaven when I die. For crying out loud, what are you going to do with the rest of your life now? Begin living it now in the kingdom of God. Begin stepping into life now. Who will save us from this body of death? Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't have to stay dead in this life any longer through Jesus Christ. He is setting us free to step out of this world of death. Sacramentally, I've left it behind. Sacramentally, I've died to the world. Sacramentally, I'm dead. But I've been resurrected to walk a new life, to live a new life. I'm still in the flesh. i am still got the same issues. I still get a flat tire. I still have a dryer that burns out. But da 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 We all live in this life, but we don't have to be deaf any longer. We don't have to be blind any longer. We can be alive in this life, in Christ, to the extent possible while we're still in the flesh, so that when we do die, we're walking with God in fullness then. That's a gospel to get excited about. That's a gospel to believe in. That is a gospel that changes our life. Well, I get excited. You can tell that. Because I live, you shall live also. Thou didst shatter death by thy cross. Thou didst open paradise to the thief. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. The dead aren't dead. Thou didst open paradise. Through Adam, though Adam and Eve, through Adam and Eve, we lost paradise. We lost the kingdom of God. We lost the ability to live in a world that united the seen and the unseen. Paradise never left. It became invisible. The kingdom of God never left. We lost our eyesight with which to see it. Our ears became deaf to God's voice. But in the fullness of time, the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. Through the incarnation, God united divinity and humanity within himself as fully God and fully man. Through the crucifixion, our weak wills will die in our own death. And through the resurrection, the dead aren't dead. Through his incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection, God has opened paradise to the thief. He has reopened paradise for all who believe. Christ stands over the shattered gates of Hades and releases Adam and Eve and restores them to paradise with him. Above the iconostasis, clean above the apse, we have the icon of the resurrection. And you see, we're down front so you cannot see if we're too close, but if we were halfway back up the aisle, you could see that you have Christ in the resurrection standing over the shattered gates of Hades and he's reaching down to Adam on one hand and Eve to the other, restoring them to life in paradise with him. We sing a, 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 the blessing hymn in our Orthro service. The company of the angels was amazed when they beheld thee numbered among the dead. Yet thyself, O Savior, destroying the power of death and with thee raising Adam and releasing all mankind from hell. Then we sing the chorus, Blessed art thou, O Lord, uh, teach me thy statutes. Wherefore, O women, disciples, do you mingle sweet-smelling spices with your tears of pity. The radiant angel within the sepulcher cried unto the myrrh-bearing women, Behold the grave and understand. For the Savior is risen from the tomb. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Very early in the morning did the myrrh-bearing women run lamenting to thy tomb. But an angel came toward them, saying, The time for lamentation is past. Weep not, but announce unto the apostles the resurrection. Blessed is thy name, O Lord. 
the myrrh bearing women mourned as bearing spices they drew new, near thy tomb O Savior but the angel spake unto them saying why number ye the living among the dead in that he is God he is risen from the grave repent and enter paradise to the living and to those in the tombs Christ proclaims a single message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for paradise is at hand. The message of the resurrection is a singular message. Proclaim to the living and to those in the tombs, death is defeated. Paradise is reopened to those who will enter. In our funeral service we sing, Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. The choirs of the saints have found the fountain of life and the door of paradise. May I also find the right way through repentance. I am a lost sheep. Call me, O Savior, and save me. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. I am an image of thy glory ineffable, though I bear the brands of transgressions. Show thy compassions upon thy creature, O Master, and purify me by thy loving kindness, and grant me the home country of my heart's desire, making me again a citizen of paradise. And then in our communion prayer, I will not give thee a kiss as did Judas, but like the thief will I confess thee. Remember me, O Lord, in thy kingdom. You see, it's here already and now already. Here already and now already, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God that has been invisibly present is now once more accessible to us. The kingdom of God which is in which the visible and the invisible, the heavenly and the earthly, the divine and the human dwell simultaneously is at hand. Paradise is reopened. Repent and believe the gospel. Wow. It's a lot to take in, a lot to absorb. But you can feel life in you. You feel something bubbling in you. You feel you're not being beaten up. You're being affirmed with life. The life-giving message that God not only loves us, he has come to give us life. He has come to set us free from the world of death that we live in. That this is all we know, so we call it life. But it isn't life. We're all winding our way, making our way to a cemetery. And Christ comes to say, I'll give you life. I'll return you to paradise. You can begin living in life now. And when that day of death comes, you'll just keep walking and step right on over. Who will deliver us from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, God bless you for coming and being part of our seminar together. We will meet again next week, and I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much.